How's hey Jeff, how's it going? Good. Dre, how are you? Um, I'm good, thank you. I just wanted to, like your comment now on Josephus that they changed his work after his death. Can you give me any historical sources for when they changed his work and when that happened exactly and who changed Yeah, in it? the fourth century. So Eusebius is most likely the guy who uh, added the Testimonium Flavianum. So the way to study this is to just uh, just type in Google Testimonium Flavianum, and there's tons of evidence about uh, the scholarship of, uh, you know, over the years of different scholars who have studied this thing to see if it's legitimate or not. Most scholars uh, say there's no way that this is even original to Josephus or legitimate. But a lot of scholars say, well, there might have been like a base mention of Jesus, but but what we have is, today is yeah, obviously is divided, manipulated by a Christian. That is a divided opinion, right? It's, it's subjective opinion. Without Everything a, in the point. world is a divided opinion. No, Everything is. No, of course. But like what you're saying, there's no real reason, there's no real way to prove what you're saying, right? Yes, there is. Uh, so, so well, first of all, yeah, you can build a circumstantial case. So you can't prove anything unless there were, you know, unless you have fingerprints or something like that. Yeah. But there is overwhelming evidence that Josephus did not write uh, the testimony in Flavium. I mean, overwhelming, like ninety percent plus chance that Josephus didn't write that, because okay. there is a lot of evidence to support this. So. There were many Christians who wrote uh, about Josephus before the fourth century, Justin Martyr, uh, Clement of Alexandria, and a whole bunch of others. And they didn't mention this testimony in Flavianum at all, but Eusebius is the first one to reference it in the fourth century. And, uh, and even the Greek word that is used, uh, it's the Greek word poetis. Uh, Josephus used that word but he did not use it uh, to mean a doer, like a verb. He used yeah. it as uh, like a, a person who is a poet, a noun, a poet. But Eusebius did use the word poetus as a verb, and it's even in the Testimonium Flavianum when it says that Jesus was a doer of mighty deeds or something like that. Well, yeah. Josephus never used that word that way, but Eusebius did. Eusebius was the first to quote the Testimonium, and there were many Christians who referenced Josephus. In fact, Clement of Alexandria said that Josephus was not a Christian, and only a Christian would write that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah, who was a superhuman, who performs miracles and resurrected so from the dead. But, sorry, but Josephus didn't write that he was a Messiah. Uh, yes, it is in Josephus. Correct, I agree with you. Josephus didn't write that, but that yeah, is just... in the modern versions of Josephus, but it was added by Eusebius. Okay, yeah, I get where you're coming from, but like, um, it seems very circumstantial, and you're pretty set in stone on the circumstance. Well, it <laughs> it's overwhelming. I mean, is, it's not. There is it's scholarly, not. There, there is scholarly dispute, right? Scholars dispute everything because scholars have yeah. different motivations and biases. Yeah, so like a the, lot of people want to yeah. say that. Jesus was real, and so they're go they're not going to say that that uh, Eusebius added this when the evidence is clear that he did. Uh, but there are scholars who have their careers writing on the fact that Jesus was real. Bart Ehrman is one of them. Yeah. Do you believe that Jesus was a real person? No, he was completely made up by the Romans uh, because because that's what's back here. The Jews revolted against Rome because they expected a Jewish Messiah to be a, a victorious military leader, not a God sent yeah. from heaven. Uh, they yeah, expected they, a if human they invented, being. If they invented Jesus. Why did they kill Christians for the first 300 years? They didn't. That's they only uh, they only persecuted the Jews, and then after no, the war, and listen, listen, Di the reign of Diocletius. Were well, you in the third century now? Uh, that's the worst part of it. And right after that, when Constantine comes and he makes it legal, suddenly all the scriptures appear, right? So suddenly something that was illegal to have for that 300 years, which you claim... We it, don't was have it was never illegal. It was never illegal to have illegal. Christian scriptures. Of course it was illegal. No. Who, who uh, said it was illegal? I've never heard that. Uh, do you really think the high priests of Rome 
would allow Christian scriptures. Yes, they were appointed by the Roman Empire. In fact, Clement of Rome, which is one of the first popes of the church, he was the head of the church in Rome uh, in the first century. The first yeah. century, this guy named Clement of Rome, he was in Rome. And uh, he was actually related to the Flavians. He was a Flavian. Yeah, but so the, the first church was started the by the first, Flavian yeah, dynasty. It's still, it's still pretty secret at that point. It's still pretty under undercover at that point. Right, because the reason is because at this time it was only created as propaganda against the Jews during the revolt. It, it was not intended to be a world religion at this point in the first and second century. But by the fourth century, they, they said, wow, we could, we could push this as a world religion. And so that's what Constantine did. But originally, it was just Jewish propaganda. Roman okay, propaganda. Can you show me your Jews. source where Constantine is like saying to these people, let's push this as a world religion? Everybody in the world knows that Constantine is the first person to, uh, to make Legalize Christianity it. the state religion. Now, Everybody he knows legalized that. It. He state sanctioned it. Right. So Constantine's the guy who did that. He yeah, didn't take it, it something that was illegal and make it, it legal. He said, listen, Dre, you, we're talking at the same time, which means we're not having yeah. a conversation. So Constantine made Christianity the state religion. He did not legalize something that was illegal. No, no. He state sanctioned it. It wasn't the main state religion. That's what you're getting. Constantine only got, he only was baptized or converted on his deathbed. Like, it wasn't, it, it was the... That's not true. Constantine had the vision, and he went to war and put crosses on his shields. Yes, but he was never baptized until he died and on his deathbed. Or right okay, he on... might not have got baptized until then. I don't know about that, but Constantine, while he was alive, pushed Christianity. Yeah, he made, he state sanctioned it. So suddenly, all the missing scriptures get compiled, get come out of hiding. Uh, okay, tell me, can you tell me? Okay, right before Constantine, right? It's Diocletius. And Diocletius I, is literally... I haven't hunted. studied Diocletian much, so yeah, I he haven't literally studied hunted, he, he literally hunted Christians for 10 years. He hunted Christians I, everywhere you go. I he doubt it very seriously. Them, I, but, I would say that is a lie. That they no, never not. hunted Christians, but they... they wanted to replace Jews. They were actually hunting Jews, but they did not want to create any sympathy for the Jews. So all they did was change Jew for Christian. And then they said, we'll generate sympathy for Christianity and we'll make this a new religion. And everybody will, 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 will be able to see people died for the faith and all this so sort of stuff. Far, you're so far off on Diocletius. It's not even funny. Like it's called the worst persecution against Christians in all of history. Yeah. Propaganda. Lies. If you believe no, what the Romans not. are putting out is propaganda, then of course you believe lies. You got to learn how okay. to read through so, the propaganda. Okay, so, so you go to the fringe sources of that time. Not I'm not going to source. any fringe sources at all. I'm using my own logic and saying you cannot believe what the Roman Empire pushed out. You can't believe what they wrote and pushed out. You have to see through the propaganda. If you just say, okay, well, you the Romans said the Romans said Christianity was true. Oh, really? And, and they say, it, no, listen, no, 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 no. listen, when you that say was, that the Christians were persecuted, but yet the, the church was always headquartered in Rome. Why would you headquarter a church in the very place where the emperor put, had his, his palace? You don't do that. Clement of Rome was a first century head of the church in Rome. And... And Irenaeus in the second century said that we all churches around the world should take their instruction from the most ancient church started by Peter and Paul in Rome. So in yes. the, I've got first century Christians in Rome. I've got second century saying that the church headquarters was in Rome. You've got the fourth century Roman Empire who pushes the Christianity as a state religion. And so you think there's one guy in the third century that said, oh, no, this is an evil religion. We can't have this. Uh, but yet the first and second and fourth century all says that Rome was supporting and pushing Christianity. And so you just want okay, to believe a story okay, that somebody ahead, said that Jared, Diocletian was actually persecuting Christians. Stop you there. All right. Give me any historical source on the first three centuries showing that Rome supported Christians. Like you're lying, and I'm calling you out. Oh, my goodness. Lying. Have you ever heard of Clement of Rome? Have you ever uh, heard yeah. of Irenaeus? Yes. 
Okay, there's two sources that I just got through telling you. Hey, if, all right. So, so, so what about that? No, no. What about that? What about the early church and their writings makes you think that they weren't persecuted? Because they were supported by Rome. It is a Roman Show narrative. In sword. fact, listen, stop. The Bible itself says that Jesus was on the Roman side and he was anti-Jew, pro-Roman. Paul was anti-Jew, pro-Roman. I'm going to stop the Bible, you there. I'm going to stop you there again because you're lying again. Show me the Bible verse where it says that Jesus I, Listen, was you call me a liar and, again and you're gone. That, that is unacceptable. You make, you, make un, you make claims that are definitely not true. Okay, so so when when Pilate came or when Jesus went before Pilate, what did Pilate say? How did Pilate judge Jesus? What was his conclusion? Um, his conclusion he said, was I was find no fault in him, even though he was yeah, claiming he, to be the king of the Jews. Yes. So Pilate had no problem with the Jew. But who did have a problem with Jesus in the Bible? Obviously the Jews, yes. Okay, so the Jews hated Jesus, but Pilate had no problem with Jesus, right? That means he is pro-Roman and anti-Jew. The Jews were the enemy. The Romans were the friends. And so when, when Jesus healed a Roman centurion's servant, uh, and the, the Roman centurion says, yeah, Lord, said, I'm a master. You, yeah. Stop. You had no one has faith he, like you. Yeah. Right. I've, so I've, he I've, said, I've, no one in all of Israel has as much faith as this Roman centurion. Like, what about, that's, okay, what about that's what that you call, thing that Jesus Dre, is now on listen, the Roman side? Dre, stop. When, when Jesus is praising the Romans and rebuking the Jews, when the Jews hated Jesus and had him crucified, but the Romans said, I find no fault with this guy. What do you call that? That's pro-Roman and anti-Jew, correct? No, this is what the Bible teaches. Okay, so when you go to court, when you go to court and you're suing someone and the other person is a different race and you lose the case, is that because the, the judge is anti-white and pro-whatever the other guy's race was? <laughs> that, no, that has nothing to do with the entire no, it Bible. To do with it. It, was a, it was a no. trial, right? When, 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 who, was, who was Paul's enemies? Who was stoning Paul? The Jews. When... Yeah. When Paul was in trouble, who did he appeal to? And he had he had he said he had their citizenship. It was the Romans. Paul was pro-Roman and anti-Jew. Jesus was pro-Roman yeah, like, and anti-Jew. Are you talking about the Roman Christians, the Gentiles, or are you talking about Romans who had not converted yet? That is completely irrelevant. No, Paul, it's not. If you're a Gentile, it means you're grafted into Israel. It means you're part of the new covenant. Nobody's grafted into Israel. Israel. What they're saying is the Israel, the, the God of Israel is now the God of the Greeks. That's what Romans chapter 11 is, the grafting in. He says God cut out the Jews, which he cut them out in war. He didn't cut them out in the 30s when Jesus was supposedly crucified. He cut them out when he destroyed the temple and their city in 70 CE. So this is proof that it was written after the war because the Jews were not cut out until after the war. So that's propaganda. This is how you can know that, that the Bible is lies. It's not telling you the truth because it's, it's, they backdated, no, they created a story yeah. in the past to say that God sent your Messiah, but you unalived your own Messiah. This is why God no longer approves of you. But you would only say the reason God no longer approves of you after the war when they were destroyed. Because nobody would believe that God didn't approve of the Jews while they were still uh, worshiping according to their design in Jerusalem at the temple. I, I get where you're coming from, Jeff. So the Bible is pro-Roman and anti-Jew. Uh, the, Christian, the Christian church is pro-Roman and anti-Jew. It always has been. Even in the first century, when you have Clement of Rome, and you, you have say pro Gentile and anti Jew. No, it's pro Roman. The Gentiles, the Romans were Gentiles. The whole yes. world was Gentiles, except Romans for the Jews. Converted. Only the Romans who convert are are Gentiles. So the other Romans who don't convert, they're not Christians. You get that, right? What? Every single person in the world was a Gentile, except for the Jews. It doesn't matter if they were Christians or not. Do you know what Gentile means? It does not mean a Christian. It means someone who is not a, 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 a Jew. It's the lost sheep. The no, it sheep. is not. It is yeah, not. It is. it is every person who is not uh, an Israelite. All right. Gentile has not. The only thing it means is you're not a descendant of Abraham. That's all it means. No. Yeah. 
Okay, I'll take that. And so Paul was came and pre he was the apostle to the Gentiles, which means the apostles to the non-Israelites all yeah. over the world, over the Roman Empire. This is why he's writing exactly. letters to yeah, Thessalonica like, and, and Corinth. Yeah, and, but if, they're, if you're referring to everyone else, then stop using Rome or Roman. It was the Roman Empire. Everybody else was in the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire was the authority that was was dictating the narrative. So it was a, it was under Roman authority. The church was in Rome, and it and it, and it was pushing out its uh, theology and dictates from Rome, where yeah. the emperor was. Yeah, it's just strange, man. Like, have you seen that? Um the the graffiti they found of the roman soldiers mocking mocking the their christian brothers or whatever with the graffiti uh, in the soldier barracks yeah i've seen that before not recently somebody brought it up recently though but it's yeah. probably uh what's the date when does it date to uh, it's first century well what they would what they were doing would they be mocking the jews and then somewhere yeah, no, along they, the way, no, 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 they, they mocked him for his nailed God. <laughs> right, that means they're mocking the Jews because this is why the Romans created Jesus. No, no, they're because mocking the, a, they're mocking a soldier for his belief in his nailed God. First century. The only nailed God would be the God of the Jews, the the Jewish Messiah, which was Jesus. Jesus was a mockery. The Romans made a mockery of the Jewish Messiah by saying that your Messiah sure came all right and you unalived him and, uh, and he's dead now. It's a mockery of Judaism. When they destroyed him in war, they said the only Messiah you can believe in is a dead one. Yeah. And all exactly. of Christianity is a mockery of all of Judaism because they, they said uh, it was God sacrificing his own son, which God said he would never do. It was the shedding of innocent blood, which God said he hated. It was condemning the innocent to pay for the guilty, which God said was an abomination. And it, and it's Jesus paying for the sins of other people, which in the Old Testament was, was something that could never happen. It says, no one can pay for the sins of another. Ezekiel 18, 20. The soul who sins yeah, no, shall die. Yeah, no, yeah, no, I get that. It makes Jesus a bit different. But anyway, um, I just want to ask you, are you religious at all? I was Christian for 30 years. I believed in God for 46 years, but now yeah. I know that it's all a scam. It's all a lie. And so I'm spreading the, the good news that, uh, that the Bible is a evil book of lies. It's strange because when I look at the early church fathers and I look at early church history, the Romans, especially their influence on it, what happened with Diocletius, with Constantine, all of that, um, how they were copied, the, the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the caves of Qumran in 1940s, do you know why the Dead Sea Scrolls were buried in the caves in the first century? Uh, because they were because to... the Romans were uh, trying to uh, to eradicate no, no, it, the Jews, no, so they were trying the, to preserve their scriptures. No, no, it was two centuries before Jesus they were buried. It's BC. Those those things may date uh, some of them date earlier than that, but they were buried most likely in the first century. Well, if they were buried in the first century, why didn't they, they weren't buried in the first century. No archaeologists, no, no, um, no, none of them would agree with you. They're all, it's all before Christ. It's all like two centuries. In fact, the consensus is it's 200 years before Christ he was buried. No, nobody can know when it was buried. All they can know is they when, can. The, it's called when the parchments date to. Yeah? It's they date it based on when what on the handwriting of the text. No, that's not all they're based it on. They're based on carbon fourteen dating. They base it on the pottery. They base it on the um, on the sedimentary layers. They, they they base it on a bunch of stuff. It's not just you're just wrong. Just let's just quickly Google it and let's just see what the internet says. Like and the the audience can Google it as well. Well, so no matter when they were buried, they were buried yeah. for the purpose of. Uh, preserving the Hebrew scriptures. There is no New Testament scriptures in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It is only Hebrew scriptures. And yes. what, whenever the Hebrews were, were trying to hide it, they were hiding it from the Romans because the Romans were the ones that were in power uh, threatening the Jews. No, by the time 200 years before that, the Roman Empire hadn't really risen yet. 
So what so is it that you're will... suggesting? You just said that they buried it because the Romans... Okay, I, what I'm are you suggesting, Dre? Dre, stop. Dre, what are you suggesting? I made a suggestion and you said no. So you tell me what you're suggesting. Um, I'm suggesting that we go with what the, the archaeologists and what the people who date these go at. Because the, in, one, in one moment, you want to listen to experts when they, when they fit your narrative. I'll but, listen. When other experts, wait, when other experts point out obvious flaws in, in, your, in what you think and how there you, you no do There is no obvious it. flaws. What, hey, what you I'm just said in first century. Dre, the consensus stop. is 200 stop. years before. I'm going to boot you, Dre. If you cannot be respectful, you're going to get booted. I apologize. So the absolute irrefutable fact of history is that the Jews uh, were destroyed by the Romans. That is an absolute indisputable fact. And, and it happened in the first and second century. There was conflict uh, that the Jews were, I mean, you go back to the Maccabean revolt in the second century BC or, or whenever this was, I think it was second century. Then they were causing conflict with uh, Antiochus Epiphanes and the Ptolemies. And so the Jews were constantly creating enemies throughout history. And yeah. whenever they buried these uh Hebrew scriptures, it's because they were afraid that they were going to get destroyed. That's why they buried the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah. Okay. I don't know exactly okay. when they buried them, but I know the yeah. reason they buried them is because they yeah. were being threatened to be destroyed. No, of course, that's where you would hide it, obviously. Wait, wait, if the Romans had this much influence on the Bible, right? Then, then obviously our Old Testament would not match the Dead Sea Scrolls. There would be a shitload of changes, right? But we don't find that. That's not what we see. So correct. The Hebrew scriptures that we have are remarkably similar to the Dead Sea Scrolls. So we have, we have pretty good evidence that the Hebrew scriptures were preserved fairly accurately as compared yeah. to Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah. All right. But, and, uh, listen, Christianity used the Old Testament scriptures. They didn't... They didn't go back and change the, uh, the Old Testament scriptures. What they did was create a New Testament, and they used the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, uh, as their b bouncing board to create Christianity. That's why they say Jesus fulfilled all these prophecies, but none of those prophecies are about Jesus. Um, actually, I've got on my channel a list of over 400 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled on a nice, neat list. So you can go look at That's 400 often. lies. Not a single one of them is about Jesus. Oh, so one, not even one of the 400 is true. Correct. Because the, Hebrews oh. mus, the Hebrew Messiah was not someone who oh. was going to come and die on the cross. Okay. The Hebrew well, Messiah uh, was, was, some, was a victorious a military in, leader. Born of a virgin in Bethlehem will be called a Galilean. Okay, like so a, let's just take those two. Just Dre. those four. Okay, so virgin birth, Bethlehem, and what was the other two? Uh, you shall be called the Galilean. I don't even know where that one is. What, are you, what is that one? It means he grew up in Galilee, dude. No, no, no. What Old Testament verse says that? Uh, uh, I'll go find I'll have to leave the live to go find it. Well, so, so let's just leave that one out for right now. What was the fourth one okay. you said? Um, it was, okay, wait. The, the shall be, wait, there's a, there's a bunch. Just I, I, I know, but and, and after we get through the top three, let's just take the top two. Let's do Bethlehem okay, and is, virgin birth, and I'll show you that neither yeah. of those are about Jesus. Okay, show me. All right, show me. So, the, show me Bethlehem one is not about Jesus. All right, Micah chapter five. So, Micah chapter five. I'm flipping there. There it is. I, I missed it. All right, so. <clears throat> I like to start with Micah chapter 1, verse 1, because it, set, it tells the setting for what Micah is even writing for. So yeah. start in Micah chapter 1, verse 1, then we'll skip to Micah chapter 5, where the, the, the supposed prophecy is. So Micah 1, 1, the word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah, the vision he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. So he says the vision was concerning Samaria and Jerusalem during the times of Hezekiah and Ahaz and Jotham. So that gives you the timing and the location, the setting of this book. Yeah. So, so Micah chapter 5, it, he didn't say anything about predicting a, a Messiah to come uh, 700 years into the future or 500 years or however long it was. 
it's, it's not a distant prophecy. It was about events that were happening during these uh, kings, uh, you know, but it can't reigns. Be, it can't be a prophecy if it's happening at the same time. A prophet prophesies the okay. future. Uh, okay, so, so now let's look at Micah chapter 5, verse 1. Marshal your troops now, city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. I think that's saying that, that Jerusalem needs to rally the troops because there is a siege that is, not, not future going to be, but is now. There is a siege laid against Jerusalem, so let's rally the troops and get ready for war. Uh, uh, they will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. I think that's a reference to Ahaz when, when the, the leader of Israel, uh, Ahaz, died. He, he had a son named Hezekiah because we're going to see in a, just a minute uh, what this person from Bethlehem is going to do. Verse 2, here's your prophecy. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. So this says somebody's going to be a ruler over Israel. First of all, Jesus was yeah. never ruler over Israel. So Jesus already failed that. Uh, and what do you mean? What do you think king of the Jews means? Jesus was not king of the Jews. He was a lunatic who claimed to be a king of the Jews, but the Jews did not accept him as a king. So he was not, he never sat on David's throne. He was never anointed as king of anything. The only thing he did, according to the narrative, is to ride a donkey into town and people threw palm leaves in front of him. And that, that's, that's a made up story too. That, that's also one of the prophecies, right? Yeah, that's Zechariah 9.9. Nine, nine. And, and we could go there. We, we could add that one as the, the third one because I'm yeah, familiar okay, but, with it. Okay, they should stick with this one. They should stick right. with this one. I'm not where, done, where I'm not pr right. done proving to you that Micah 5 has nothing to do with Jesus whatsoever. So, so it says that somebody is going to rule over Israel. Jesus never ruled over Israel. So who could this possibly be talking about? Let's keep reading. That, Verse it, 3. But it mentions Jerusalem as well, right? Uh, I don't know that it mentions Jerusalem specifically. Uh, it mentions Judah, and it mentions Israel. Uh, I don't recall it mentioning, you know, when it, I think it's referencing Jerusalem in verse 1, but it says that a siege is laid against us. It's not necessarily Jerusalem, but I would assume it might, it might be. And Christ rules over New Jerusalem, right? Well, so let's just re keep reading Micah. Micah, verse 3. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son. So this is saying that a son is going to come and that Israel is going to be abandoned uh, until this son comes. And Ahaz was the king before Hezekiah. This is talking about Hezekiah, and I can prove it. Uh, so this is saying Ahaz was the king who was struck on the cheek and and and. A and Judah was abandoned until the son was born, and the son was Hezekiah. Uh, but it says, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. And he will be our peace. When the Assyrians invade our land and march through our fortresses. The, the claim to fame that Hezekiah has in Chronicles and Kings and, uh, is that he was the king who protected Judah from the Assyrian invasion. And Micah chapter 1 says, I'm talking about the days of Ahaz and Hezekiah. Ahaz was a bad king. Hezekiah no, the, was a good no, king. No, no, no. The prophecy is in the days of Hezekiah. It does not. It doesn't mention that it's talking about the days of Hezekiah. It's 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 originally during the days of Ahaz, and it's talking about the son that is going to be born to Ahaz. And and yeah, none and of these prophecies were written what in the it, past. Yeah. What does it say about his origins again? So when it says that his origins are from old, it's just saying that God has predetermined from from eternity that He was going to appoint a leader for us. It's not saying that this was an eternal being, but that God had predetermined uh, the future, the past, present, and future. And so God knew about this way before we did. Uh, sorry, I was always just like taking it like word for word. Like I just. Right. I so, but, but when you read, uh, when you read, when God told David, 
that you can't build a temple for me, but I will uh, be a God, I will be a father to Solomon, and he will be to me a son, and I will establish his kingdom forever. You see, you got to understand that that Solomon is not still reigning today. It's not literal. It's just anointing language. It's just kingly language. It says, "O oh, king, live forever, and may you peace rule over the world, all the world forever." It's it's uh, hyperbole. It's exaggerated language. No, I, I get that. And so that. this okay. person that comes from Bethlehem has yeah. he has to be according to verse five, he has to be their peace when the Assyrians invade the land. So Jesus was not around. Jesus didn't bring peace for anything. Jesus, in fact, said, "I did not come to bring peace, but a sword." Chet, isn't but the yet, Assyrians invading the land right now? No, dude. The Assyrians don't even exist anymore. Yeah, they go by a different name now, right? Right. So, so this is talking about when Ahaz was king and Hezekiah came and protected them from Assyria. Yeah, it's that's, not a that's miraculous book that's miraculously telling the future two, three thousand years into the future. There's nothing miraculous about the Bible. No, it is that's all exactly written what by it is. It humans. Is a book that tells the future. That's how you know it's true. No, that's how you know that you believe lies. It it even it tells you. So it's not ever predicting the future. They wrote all these stories after the Assyrians invaded the land, and it's it, they just wrote it as a song of praise to, to Hezekiah, but they wrote it as if it was a prophecy in the past because this is how you lie to people and convince them that God is on your side because you all you do is write a story and backdate it and say that God told us this was going to happen before it did. So if you just believe what you're told, then, then when you go to a magician's uh, show, you think he actually pulled a rabbit out of a hat magically. No, it's trickery. Okay, it's like, deception. All right, but how would, how would a prophet predicting a virgin birth? The all virgin right, so, birth so now we'll go to Isaiah 7, uh, and I'll prove to you that Isaiah 7 is not about Jesus. I just proved to you that Micah 5 no, didn't is about Hezekiah. It. No, you didn't prove that Hezekiah won. Hezekiah okay, has... Hezekiah did rule over Israel. It says that he was going to rule over Israel. Jesus did not rule over Israel. Yeah, he Hezekiah did. He just, did. Listen. Jesus said, my kingdom listen, is at hand. Stop, Dre. It's a spiritual, it's a spiritual kingdom. N no, you can make up whatever lies you want to, and this is, this is how you believe lies. And if you're not interested in the truth, then you don't need to be on my channel because I'm telling you the truth, and you're wanting to believe lies. So um, it is not a prediction of the future. It was a telling of something that already happened. And it, and it, and Jesus did not bring peace when the Assyrians invaded the land. And, and you've got to be dishonest to ignore what the text says about this person coming from Bethlehem just because you want to believe the, the Roman propaganda. Well, so okay, if you I'll, want to I'll, believe I'll, lies, right. I can't help you. No, no, I'll, let's say I'll take that one. You can prove the, the, the next one. All right, so let's go to Isaiah 7. So this is the way every single prophecy is in the Old Testament. There is not a single thing anywhere in the Old Testament about Jesus, but what they did, what the Romans did, is they took the Jewish scriptures and they reinterpreted it, and they created a new mythical Greek demigod named Jesus, and whenever they would, whenever something would fit the Greek narrative in the Hebrew scriptures, they would tell a story so like Zechariah 9.9, 9, so all we got to do is say that Jesus rode a donkey into town and we'll say it was uh, a prophecy from yeah. Zechariah 9.9. 9. But when you go read right. Zechariah 9.10, okay. yeah. it proves that I'll it's not the, about I'll Jesus. The, you Sorry, man. I'll you prove this one. Can we go to Psalm 22? Yeah, I wrote a book about Psalm 22, so sure. All right, good. Uh, so, but you, yeah, do the Zechariah one first. Well, let's, let's do the virgin birth. Then we can go to Zechariah. Then we can go to Psalm 22 if you want. Okay, great. So great. I'm in Isaiah 7 now. All right. So Isaiah 7 is not about Jesus in the slightest little bit. It's about, uh, it, it's actually expressly f fulfilled in the very next chapter in Isaiah 8. All you have to do is read the context and you find out that none of this was about Jesus, but it was all about things that were happening in their day that was fulfilled. Because this is how you prove that somebody's a, a prophet anyway. It has to happen within their lifetime so that they can say, oh my goodness, he predicted the future. So God must really be true. But most people couldn't even read and write. And so they would just take whatever the priest told them. Uh, and most of this stuff wasn't even for the people alive at the time anyway. It was for the subsequent generations. 
uh, to convince them that God was on their side. But let's look at Isaiah 7, verse 1. It says, when Ahaz, so we're talking about the same time frame. Ahaz is king, same as Micah. So the exact same time frame when Ahaz is king. This is slightly before Micah because Micah 5 is talking about the end of Ahaz's reign and the start of Hezekiah's. Now we're talking about uh, we're in the middle of Ahaz's reign. So it says, when Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, was king of Judah, king Rezin of Aram, and Pekah, son of Ramalia, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem, but they could not overpower it. So we've got two enemies that are coming up against the king of Judah, which is Ahaz. And, and verse 2 says, now the house of David, that's, that's a reference to Ahaz, the house of David, because he was the king of Jerusalem or Judah, uh, and he was a descendant of David. He says, he was told, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim, so the, hearts of, the heart of Ahaz and his people were shaken as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. So he's scared. King Ahaz is scared because there are yeah. two enemies that have created an alliance to come down and destroy him. So verse 3, Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out, you and your son, Shir Jashub, to meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the launderer's field. Say to him, Be careful, keep calm, and do not be afraid. Do not lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood, because of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and of the son of Ramalia. So you've got these two enemies coming against Ahaz, and he's scared, but God says, Don't be scared. I, you know, I, I'll take care of you. So yeah. verse 5, Aram, Ephraim, and Ramalia's son have plotted your ruin, saying, Let us invade Judah. Ahaz is the king of Judah. So let the two enemies invade Judah uh, and let us tear it apart and divide it among ourselves and make the son of Tabil king over it. Yet this is what the sovereign Lord says. So, so they're saying we're going to go destroy Ahaz and Judah and we will set up our own king uh, over the region. But the, Lord, the sovereign Lord says this in verse 7. It will not take place. It will not happen for the head of Aram is Damascus and the head of Damascus is Rezin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria. The head of Samaria is only Ramalia's son. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. So God interjects and says, this is not going to happen. Even though Ahaz is scared of these two enemies coming to war, he says, don't worry, Ahaz. Even though Ahaz was a bad king, God says, I'm going to protect you anyway. Verse 10, again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough that you try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Uh, the Alma, which means young maiden, not virgin. The Hebrew word Alma means young maiden. So... It says the young maiden will conceive. And every time that word conceive is used, it always means she has sex with a man because this is how babies are born. It is, it is not saying at all that there's going to be a miraculous sexless birth because the yeah. word conceive Wait, uh, implies we, a man yeah, and a woman like, having sex. Uh, okay, but like what is the, what is the, the Hebrew word used there? Say again. Uh, the For word that is sometimes translated virgin is Alma, A-L-M-A. It does not mean virgin. There's a different Hebrew word, Bethula, which means virgin. So I'll they use the word that means It'll young maiden. No, I'll definitely look into this. And, and so when it says she will conceive, this is the same word that is used like every time anybody conceives, and, and it always implies sex. It, the Bible does not have to say the man put his thing in the woman's thing. It just says All that right. a woman conceived, and that implies sex. Uh, and give birth to a son, so we know that this woman is going to have a son, and yeah. he will be called Emmanuel. He will yeah, be eating that, curds and well, honey. Well, what when, does Emmanuel mean in Hebrew? It, Emmanuel means God is with us. The same thing that all the yeah. names had meaning. So Samuel means God hears. Emmanuel means God is with us. So it yeah. does not mean that the baby is going to be yeah. God. It means yeah, that it, this baby will, his name is going to mean 
God still watches over us. God is still with us. That's what it means. It does not okay. mean that the baby is God. I mean, that would be laughed out of the building if you're asked a Hebrew, what does Emmanuel yeah, they, mean? It, it means yeah, God is with us. Up, God is. Yeah, they would pick up stones to stone you. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, so, if, yeah, if you ever said that God was a human, they absolutely would say that's blasphemy because it is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so, I, but it's listen. It's not blasphemy now, but yeah. Uh, it would always be blasphemy. It's blasphemy today when you say that Jesus is God. That's blasphemy. Well, because Jesus himself didn't say he was God. God among us, right? All right, well, that, that's a different story, so let's keep yeah. going. Verse 15, he will be eating curds and honey. He, the son, the boy, is going to eat curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. Verse 16, this is the critical verse. For before the boy, this is the boy who's going to be born, the one who would be called Emmanuel. Before that boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. So this is, had to be a boy that would be born in Ahaz's lifetime because he says before that boy is old enough to know right from wrong, these two countries that have plotted, that have allied together to plot your ruin, they will be destroyed instead of you. This is the sign that God was going to give Ahaz that a woman was going to have a boy and that boy was still going to be a, a, an infant. When the well, two enemies that well, have plotted the, his ruin by, would be destroyed. Yeah, but by Jesus' time, both those are destroyed. Oh, my goodness. It says before that boy is old enough, he said, I'm going to give you a sign, Ahaz. I'm not going to give uh, you know, people a sign 700 years from now. He says, I'm going to give you a sign. And this woman is going to have a baby. And while that baby is still an infant, your enemies will be destroyed. It has to be during his lifetime. It cannot be about Jesus. But, but let me prove it to you even further. So uh, let's just skip. I, I don't think the rest of it, we could read that, but let's skip to chapter 8 because this is the fulfillment. In chapter 8, verse 1, The Lord said to me, Take a large scroll and write on it with an ordinary pen, Maher Shalal Hashbaz. So I called in Uriah the priest and Zechariah son of Jerob, Jeberechiah, as reliable witnesses for me. Then I made love to the prophetess, and she conceived and gave birth to a son, a boy. Hmm, awful convenient. This, this young maiden has a son, and the Lord said to me, name him Maher Shalal Hashbaz, for before the boy knows how to say father or mother, the wealth of Damascus and the plunder of Samaria will be carried off by the king of Assyria. So those were the same two enemies that were coming against Ahaz. It was Damascus and Samaria, or which is Syria and Ephraim, or Israel and uh, Damascus. Those are all the same names for the same places. It's Syria and Israel, or Damascus and Samaria. Uh, and so he says, this boy, and his name even means, uh, his name means quick to the plunder and swift to the spoil. So, so it's saying that you're going to quickly defeat your enemies and you will quickly be able to plunder their uh, riches. So, but if you keep reading, it makes it even further uh, uh, proof. Verse 5, the Lord spoke to me again. Because the people rejected the gently flowing waters of Shiloh and rejects and rejoices over Rezin, the son of Ramalia. Therefore the Lord is about to bring against them the mighty flood waters of the Euphrates, the king of Assyria, with all his pomp. It will overflow all its channels, run over its banks, and sweep on into Judah, swirling over it, passing through it, and reaching up to the neck. Its outspread wings will cover the breadth of your land, Emmanuel. Uh, and I believe it's also in this verse that uh, God tells Isaiah that your children will be a sign for Israel. So all your children are going to be signs for Israel. And chapter 8 is where Isaiah apparently makes love to his prophetess wife, and they have a So this son is likely Isaiah's son, no, and his name is... I don't think it's likely. They refer to as different titles. No, it even calls him Emmanuel in verse 8. It says, 
So the word Emmanuel only appears two times in the Old Testament, right here in Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 8. It doesn't appear anywhere else in the entire Bible, except for Matthew chapter 1, where whoever wrote Matthew wanted to attribute it to Jesus, and it's not about Jesus. So this demonstrates that whoever wrote the New Testament was taking things out of context, changing the meaning, and applying it to their narrative instead of properly interpreting the Hebrew Scriptures as they are written. So yeah, it demonstrates no. the dishonesty of Christianity. No, no, I, I, I don't agree with that, but yeah, okay, I, I get what so you're coming from. So where did from. you see I, Jesus? I, I, Anywhere in chapter 7 or 8, where did you see Jesus? It says well, before I the boy. Know that the Hebrew word for that was young maiden, so I'll have to go look into that. Right, like, so I'm yeah, just, just go do your notes. research on that. No, no, look, dude, if you're showing me things that I haven't thought about, or, right. like, I'm, I'm not insulting you. Research. Right. All right, uh, all right, next one is, like, uh, I'll take the L's on both those because I'm not well versed. All right, so let's go to Zechariah 9 9. How about Isaiah 53? Well, so uh, that's getting in line behind Psalm 22. So let's go to Zechariah 9 9. And I've looked at all these. So, by the way, I, uh, there is no prophecy anywhere in the, the Old Testament about Jesus. What they did is the Romans reinterpreted the Hebrew Scriptures and they created a mythical Greek demigod that fit in with the Greek culture and that would also be an insult and a mockery to the Jews. So they took their own Scriptures and mocked them with it. And, and they would take something like Isaiah 53 and say, which Isaiah 53 never says the word Messiah at all. There is no Messiah anywhere in Isaiah 53, but the Romans would have you believe that Isaiah 53 is a messianic prophecy. It's not. There is I, no I such thing as a, I mean, we can a, go a suffering that. Messiah. I Isaiah 53 a bit, so that's a good one to go through. That's one well, I can convert with you on. <laughs> yeah. So let's look at Zechariah 9.9. Uh, right. So Zechariah 9.9, I don't even have to go get a whole bunch of context for this one. This one, this one is easily disproven in 30 seconds. So, rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion, shout, daughter of Jerusalem, see your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. I will okay. take away the, okay, here we go, verse 10, verse 10 disproves it. So, so first of all, it's not saying that a, a Messiah is going to come and whoever rides on a donkey is your Messiah because everybody rode donkeys. So, there's nothing special about riding a donkey. Uh, and, and no, but it it's is like, special if a king is riding a donkey. Kings don't ride donkeys. Well, you know, and if Jesus was a king, then maybe that would be something. But Jesus was never king. He was. Jesus. Okay. Jesus was a he lunatic said, who claimed Jesus, to be a king of the Jesus, Jews who who was unalive. Jesus continually preached the kingdom. He said the kingdom of God is at hand. Okay, but he preaching the kingdom does not mean you are a king. His, he, he was preaching about a spiritual kingdom, and he is that king. Okay, but yeah, keep going. All right, so let's read verse 10, because verse 10 disproves uh, the whole deal. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim. Ephraim is another word for the northern tribes of Israel. So there's not going to be any more war in, in if Ephraim. And the war horses from Jerusalem. So there's not going to be any wars in Jerusalem either. And the no, battle bowl... No, he's taking the war horses and the chariots. It doesn't say there's not going to be any more wars. Well... I mean, if you go to war, but you don't have any chariots or war horses, then you're going to lose. Well, you can always get new ones, right? But what's you the point of saying I'm going to take away the chariots yeah, like and if, war horses? If I take, if I take, if, 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 if I write that I'm going to take the nation's chariots would take it, that doesn't mean in perpetuity they'll never have chariots again. Okay, but what, what did Jesus have to do with taking away chariots and war horses? What, how did Jesus fulfill that? Um, because after Jesus was crucified, 40 years later, Jerusalem was completely destroyed and it hasn't been rebuilt since. So I guess you could say, well, uh, so it says the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So whoever this is talking about is talking about yeah, somebody but, who's going to bring peace and end war. Jesus okay, brought like, war. Well, if you if you don't think it's Jesus, who whose kingdom is to the ends of the earth? That's again hyperbole. That's this is the way they would talk about. Oh, King, live forever. Your rule will extend from yeah. the, to the ends of the earth. That's it's hyperbole. 
Okay. But Jesus so this, is ruled. This, uh, listen, yeah, but this, does Jesus this, rule? This listen, at what point has Jesus ever ruled the whole world? My friend, I keep referring to you about the spiritual kingdom of God, the kingdom that is... Okay, hand, there the is no spiritual kingdom of Jesus that rules the whole world even today. It never has. So Jesus has not fulfilled this either if you want to interpret it that way. So again... Yeah, I, can see where, I can see where you're coming from, but yeah. All right, so, so whoever this is talking about, and I'm not really even sure who it's talking about because I know the context of Zechariah is about the Maccabean revolt. This is the context when you read the whole book. So I don't know if it's talking about, it could be talking about uh, Alexander the Great. I don't know. Uh, because Alexander the Great did rule the whole world to the end of the earth. And you could say that he was the, the, the king who brought peace everywhere because he conquered the whole world and then everybody lived under the, the Hellenized world or the Greek world. But I, I need to study this one a little bit more so I can figure out exactly who it's talking about. But I know yeah. it's not talking about Jesus. Because Jesus didn't rule anything. He didn't bring peace. So the only thing is, whoever wrote the New Testament said, let's just pull this verse out of context, Zechariah 9, 9. We'll say Jesus rode on a donkey. And so this, this will be proof. And, and we can easily convince yeah. the gullible people that who yeah, don't I want to study that, their Bibles. Yeah, the thing is, when Jesus was walking around, he ruled life and death because he could raise people from the dead. He ruled nature because he could command the wind and the weather. He ruled matter because he could multiply things. Like he, like if you if if you could do that, then you are the ruler, right? Except there is no in in real history there is no miracle man who did any of that. So the only thing that says that Jesus performed any miracles at all is the Roman propaganda that we can prove is false because Jesus made all sorts of promises that, that never came true. So we know that this guy was a liar and a false prophet. And so when you study as much as I have and find out that the Romans wrote the New Testament, that's why it's all in Greek. That's why they only quoted the Greek Septuagint. And, uh, and that's why they changed the Jewish Messiah from what he was really expected to be into just a loser, a, a person who came and was publicly beaten and died and then he went to heaven and if you want to be with your jewish messiah you also yeah, need to die and go to heaven yeah that's that's contestable you you can say they wrote it all in that, that that that's what survived they also wrote it in aramaic i don't think the churches of asia minor had those languages i think they're like definitely had their own scriptures and their own language probably their own translations but it just it probably didn't survive so the only e real evidence that we have in fact i think all the scholars would agree that uh every indication is that the new testament was written in greek originally it was not translated from aramaic or hebrew it was originally no, 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 written I, in greek no i i agree i it, it was probably written in greek because, uh, and everybody also agrees that these things, well, a lot of people try to say some of it was written before 70. They say Paul was written before 70. Uh, yeah. And it's not. It wasn't. But this is what they want you to believe well, it, because it, uh, it promotes the narrative. Yeah, well, we know, like, for example, when Paul is writing, we know, uh, for example, the death of Stephen happens in a certain era, so certain time period. So when, when they're referring to that, they're no, Stephen is not a historical figure anywhere in the world except for the Bible. Stephen only appears in the Bible. That guy doesn't exist anywhere else. So you can't date the Bible by saying we know Stephen was a historical figure and we know he lived here, we know he died there. No, the Bible is not a reliable, it is a claim that is not verified or corroborated by other, by any other testimony. Not It's not like they have one or two others. Uh, so the only thing that supports the biblical narrative are the biblical books. You know, when you go, when you when you pick up the I books thought, that were not Joseph canonized. Supported it. I thought Tacitus supported it. I no, thought, so uh, it depends. So, so Josephus didn't write about Jesus or Christianity. So Eusebius added Jesus to Josephus in the fourth century after Constantine gave him the authority to manipulate the evidence. Tacitus said that whoa, Christians whoa, whoa. called themselves. Show me, please, please show me where. Constantine gives him the permission to change it. Remember, when Constantine like, made the, Christianity the, the state religion, we're talking about like I've never heard of 
Have you ever heard of people saying to historians, okay, look, you need to go rewrite those history books right now. So do you know that Eusebius is called a polemicist? Do you know what the definition of a polemicist is? No. It's a warlike defender of the faith. He wasn't just an apologist. He was a polemicist. An apologist just makes excuses for why, to, why you can believe, you can interpret things to support your narrative. A polemicist is someone who goes out and actively destroys the enemy's uh, evidence and manufactures evidence for himself. That's what a polemicist does. That's what okay, Eusebius so is considered. Yeah, but that's why, he's, that's why Josephus' testimony about Christ is, he makes it even more credible because he wasn't a Christian. Oh my goodness, dude. There is no credibility whatsoever to the testimony of Flavianum. Every scholar knows that Josephus didn't write that, but some Christian manipulated it down the road, and the evidence points to Eusebius being the guy who manipulated it. All right, but okay, let's say Tacitus, the Roman historian, right? right so, the, the so, the, Rome. so the only thing Tacitus said about Jesus or Christianity is he said that the Christians, so the Christians did exist, and he said the Christians call themselves Christians because of a man who suffered the most extreme penalty at the hands of one of our own procurators, uh, Pontius Pilate. And, and he says, uh, and, and the guy's name was Crestus. Well, Jesus's name was not Crestus. I mean, it was just, well, you could say it was Yeshua. To, all right. But he's referred to it as, as like, all right. So Tacitus points out that this guy, right? He had followers, right? His followers were following In his day, right. Yeah, in, yeah, in the early second century, were following someone who was that they thought was, that they were claiming the was unalive by Pontius Pilate, Romans, and he was called Christos, the Christ, Cre Christus. So, so it said his name, someone by the name of Christus. It was not his name, uh, so he didn't understand who they were talking about. He was just saying yeah, the Christians that are around. Uh, so, listen for a second. Let me get through the thing, and then I want to hear what your response is. So. Yeah. Crestus was not Jesus's name. Tacitus was simply saying this is why they call themselves Christians because they claim that some guy named Crestus died. Uh, he's not saying that there really was a guy named Crestus died. He's saying that they call themselves this is because that's what they believe. And he, yeah. because he followed that up and said this, and then I'll let you hear it speak. He said, this mischievous superstition first had its origin in Judea and made its way to where all things despicable come from the city of Rome itself. So he called it a mischievous superstition. That means it's not true. They, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lie that started in Judea and moved to yeah, Rome. He, was, he, was a, he wasn't a Christian. He wasn't a Jew. He was a Roman. So obviously he, they had nothing but disdain for Jews and Christians. Right, so the only thing Tacitus is saying is that Christians existed. He's not testifying that Jesus existed. He, dev he never met Jesus at all. He's just saying that these Christians are, followers are a group of, of people Christ. who follow a That's man. Literally what they are. Christians are followers of Christ. Correct, but in the second century, he's not testifying that Jesus was real. He's just testifying that Christians were real. My friend, you just said that Christianity was made up a few minutes or a little while ago by by Constantine in the third century. So how do you have a guy a hundred years? I did not that? ever say that, Dre. You either need to start listening or quit being dishonest. I said Christianity started after the first. It's even right here on the board. The origin of Christianity. I've got 64 and 70 CE. I didn't, I didn't say nothing on this whole background about Constantine or the fourth century. Do you see yeah, that? that all right, but you mentioned that Constantine gave people, especially historians, the, uh, he told them to go change the history, right? You said you that. that he did. Right. Okay. So w whenever the Roman Empire says, we, I want to push this religion over all other religions, uh, then, of course, they're going to manufacture evidence to support their religion. It's not because okay. he believed it was true or because he had some... Oh, yeah, some revelation of Jesus Christ or something. He just said, yeah. this is a good religion to push on the world. Yeah, no, I get I really do understand where you're coming from. I'm on the other camp. You know, I was an atheist half my life. I, ne I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I didn't have I didn't have well, any Christian influence. Wait, well, see, I was a Christian. I was, in, I was walking next to a river and I had a vision from God. And I saw angels and I saw demons and lots of things and I realized it's all true. That's how I became a Christian. That's how when I started studying the sources. 
Okay, but so I, so if you had a vision I, I of God, I've never had a vision of God. So so all I can do is study the evidence from an intellectual standpoint because not God's never performed a miracle for me. So yeah. if you believe Christianity is true simply because you had a vision, then and you don't even care what the Bible says because I'm I'm studying it from an intellectual and historical and rational perspective. You're studying it from the fact that you saw a heavenly vision and uh, something that you could only testify to yourself that you can't even prove happened. Well, um, I read the New Testament and it rang true to my ears. That's all. So do you think so? Do you think child sacrifice is a good thing? Do you think shedding the innocent blood of someone is good? Would this be a, a thing that God would approve of? In fact, I can show you Depends in the Old Testament that God says none, He hates these yeah, things. Like no one, no, no. The Bible clearly says there are, there's none innocent. No, not one, there's including none Jesus. Righteous. So Jesus was not innocent. That's what makes him God. You see, you're just proving the Trinity even more. But anyway, can we please go to Isaiah fifty-three? We've All right, had... you want to skip? You want to skip Psalm twenty-two? No, we can go to. We can go. To... This we can go Isaiah. to Isaiah 53 now. That's fine. Everybody everybody likes Isaiah 53. Oh. So, to really understand Isaiah 53, you need to understand a lot of context. Because if you start in Isaiah chapter 40, I've made some TikTok videos on this. Uh, there are probably 10, at least 10 different verses that lead up to Isaiah 53 that specifically call Israel or Jacob. That's the same thing. Israel and Jacob mean the same thing. But sometimes it says Israel. Sometimes it says Jacob. It says, "You, are, Israel is my servant. Israel is my chosen one, the one that I selected to be my very own servant. Israel or Jacob. It says it over and over and over. And let me read one, one that I remember, Isaiah 48, 20, because it's a pretty good verse. Isaiah 48, 20. So this is just, Five chapters before Isaiah 53, so it's it's in the context uh, five chapters before. He says, leave Babylon, free, flee from the Babylonians. Announce this with shouts of joy and proclaim it. Send it out to the ends of the earth, says the Lord, or the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. So the context of the entire uh, second half of Isaiah is that Israel is leaving Babylonian captivity and they are starting a new heaven and earth. Isaiah 65 talks about the new heaven and earth where the, the wolf eats with the lamb and the lion uh, has to eat straw because his teeth is ripped out. Yeah, um, Jesus, like, Jesus did eat with the normal people. The wolves did dine with the lamb. Right, those are all... Okay, but please, let's go to Isaiah 53. So, uh, so just so you know, before you get to Isaiah 53, there's a whole bunch of context that says that Jacob is the servant. So anytime you see the word servant in the book of Isaiah, especially the second half or starting in chapter yeah. 40 All right. of Isaiah. He's talking about the suffering servant. All right, let's He's talking this. about, so, and, and Israel did suffer in Babylon because yeah. Isaiah 48, 20 says, come out of Babylon, my suffering servant. Yeah. So, as, so Israel is the suffering servant. So if, if you want to force Jesus to be in here, then that's dishonest. You've got to read the context and you've got to understand it from what it was originally written to be, not what the Romans told you to think it means. So now let's look at Isaiah 53. Okay, but then, wait, wait, wait. So if, if, if the Messiah, okay, you're claiming that Israel is the suffering servant, right? Correct. But didn't Israel reject the suffering servant? So are you claiming that Israel rejected Israel? No. Jesus is not the suffering servant. Well, so the Israel only suffering Israel. servant was Israel in Isaiah. Yeah, but then, Nobody then ever Israel, thought of Jesus in yeah, the Old wait, Testament. You're not answering my question. Didn't, didn't Israel reject the suffering servant? Israel rejected Jesus because Jesus was not the, uh, the Jewish Messiah. You just proved my point. You just said Israel is the suffering servant, and then you said in the next sentence, Israel rejected the suffering servant. No, so, I didn't. I said because Jesus is not the suffering servant. Jesus didn't even exist. Jesus is completely fake. He is a Roman demigod created okay, so after the war reject? to mock who did the Jews. Israel reject well, the, actually, 
Israel only rejected Jesus according to the Christian narrative. Israel was never even presented with Jesus in reality no, because Jesus only, never existed. Only, yeah, yeah, if the only person they ever rejected was Jesus, then Jesus is the suffering servant. I'm just proving my Jesus point. was not even real. He did not exist at all. It is so a the propaganda servant? campaign. When you read, so now let's read Isaiah 53. And I know Christians want to force Jesus into everything, but if you would be honest for just a second and study for truth instead of study to support the Christian narrative, then you could learn the truth. But you don't want I mean, the I'm, truth. You, dude, I've, I've already no, proven. Dude, hey, dude, I've been taking notes this whole time. I've been learning from you. So trust me, I am learning from you. And, and so, right? so Drake, and, and, I, and I don't disrespect you because I know it's difficult to admit that we've been duped. I had to admit that I was duped. Because My I friend, believe wait, you can, no, you I, can I even go. Saying. Listen, but you can you go did, back. I just, oh, yeah, but I just, I, in my last few sentences, I explained to you that you pointed out that Israel is the suffering servant. Correct. Then I pointed out to you, but Israel rejects the suffering servant. So how can Israel be the suffering servant? You don't have an Israel never rejected a suffering servant. It is a propaganda narrative that did not even happen in the New Testament. The New Testament is completely fake. It's all lies. It's yeah, Roman propaganda. The, the rejection, Jesus the never ever presented is... himself as king of Israel because Jesus never even existed. It's propaganda. It is a lie. It was, it was, Jesus was created after the war just to tell the Jews that don't ever expect your Messiah to show up because we are telling you that your Messiah showed up and you crucified him. And so now uh, Judaism is over. Your temple is destroyed. Your city is destroyed. Your Messiah already came. So don't ever try to organize some rebellion against Rome again, expecting some Messiah to show up because this is the only narrative that you are allowed to believe in. If you, if any Jew ever thinks that they're their Messiah is going to come and free them from Roman Empire. We will quickly come and, and destroy you because they did it. There was a Bar Kokhba revolt in 130 CE where the Jews were organizing another revolt against Rome because Bar Kokhba was considered the, to be the Messiah. And so the, Jew, the uh, Romans destroyed the Jews again and kicked them out of Jerusalem for a thousand years. A thousand years. They were not even allowed back into Jerusalem except one day a year on the Day of Atonement so that they could mourn the loss of their temple. That is the only reason the Romans allowed the Jews to return to Jerusalem was just to remember that, that the Romans destroyed them. That's it. You can celebrate a day where you lost a war. So when... Yeah, so you're saying when Jesus is walking around talking to the Pharisees and all those people... It's impossible because they were only allowed one a day, one day a year in the place. No, everything you just said is completely not anything that I said, or it's not even related to what I was talking about. Sorry, then I must have lost my train of thought. But we can go to Isaiah fifty-three. Like, All right, so Isaiah fifty-three. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So you got to understand that the context all around Isaiah in this section is the the. Uh, the freeing of Israel out of Babylonian captivity. It's all about Babylon. You just study the context. Uh, all start in chapter 40, and it's constantly talking about Israel suffering in Babylon and then coming out. That's the time frame in the context of, of this section of Isaiah. And so when it says, okay. to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? It's saying God has freed us from Babylonian captivity, so God still loves us. God is... Uh, you know, given us his mighty arm of strength to free us from Babylonian captivity. We just came out of Babylon. That's the context. Verse 2, he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. So it's personifying somebody. It's talking about him. And yeah, it's, it's 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 a messianic prophecy, but yeah. Well, going. it doesn't it doesn't use the word Messiah anywhere in here. So the fact that you are uh, assuming that it is a messianic prophecy says let, that okay let, that that you're forcing the Christian narrative. All right. The go context to, says that the it's all talking about. Is, sorry, man. Just go to the way it's the arm of the Lord and read it slowly from there. Let's just take it, and then we can be respectful. Okay. He grew like, up. He so you got to say. 
it, it just starts talking about he. So you have to say who is the he. Christians are assuming yeah. that he is Jesus. Um, yeah. But it's not Jesus because there's nothing in here that uh, is that is talking about Jesus. Jesus was never predicted or prophesied anywhere in the Hebrew Scriptures. And the context is saying that it specifically calls Israel the servant. So, and, and it and somewhere in here it uses the word servant. And so the when you say who is the servant and you read the context, it says over and over that Israel is the servant. And when it talks about Israel, the servant coming out of Babylon, this is the context and the meaning. Okay. So the whole debate is who is the he? That's what it is. Who is the right. he? And the he suffering up, servant, right? That's my debate with you. So, so you can say suffering servant. So sure, this is all about a suffering servant. But right. then you say who is the servant? Christians yeah. say the servant is Jesus. And yeah. Jews say the servant is Israel. Okay, good. Because the context says it's Israel. Uh, he grew up before him like a tender shoot, uh, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. So that little section is just saying there was nothing special about this this guy, whoever this guy is. Uh, yeah, you, especially about his appearance. It just it, it's not really about his character or anything like that. It's more like his appearance. Yeah, so so, so I don't you think you, him, you can yeah. you can't make any strong points from that little section at all. It's just it's just mundane. Verse three. Okay. He was despised and rejected. He was. So this it's not saying he's going to be, it's not saying the Messiah will be, it's saying he was. So if you take it for what it says, it's past tense. It's talking about somebody that was already uh despised and rejected. Well, Israel yeah. was despised and rejected. The context explicitly says Israel is the servant that was suffering. And so right. the context overwhelming is, is supporting I'll, that Israel I'll, I'll is the one that. that was despised and rejected. But Christians just want this to be Jesus. So they say, well, even though it is past tense, uh, it's, you know, to God, the past, present, and future makes no difference. So God's actually speaking about future, but he wrote it in past tense. And that's just dishonest. Because yeah, I think you, God knew. I think God knew the when the books would be available to us all, and we in our time it will all be past tense. But yeah, yeah, keep going. So you're saying you think that Isaiah 53 was written to you? That it's like for all those people, the thousands of years that have read Isaiah before us, it it wasn't talking to them. It was only talking to me because when I read it, I feel like God's talking to me directly. So when since Jesus was in my past, Jesus, God knew when he wrote this that when I read it, I would look in my past and see Jesus. So, yeah, no, good point. No, good point. I can see that. I take the L on that one. But yeah, so, so, so you have to, when you read ancient scripts of any kind, you have to read it from the original context, the original perspective, the original yeah. audience, the original author, what did they mean by it? You can't just take something and, and apply your 2,000 year future uh, narrative to something that was written two or 3,000 years into the past. You have to yeah. understand it from its original context. So let's okay, keep well, reading. Off, off these appearance. Start from off these appearance. Uh, Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Verse 3, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. So again, whoever the he is, is he doesn't look special uh, and he's despised and rejected. He's, he's a man of suffering. It's gonna, I think it's going to say that. Uh, I don't know if it says that for sure or not. But, but it, it's referring to... to to him being a human, right? Well, it's like whoever a, it is. Appearance? Well, whoever it is is, is that, being at least human, personified. The human who, who, who his appearance doesn't. It's not going to strike you. It's not going to be like you're not going to be overwhelmed by his appearance, and he's going to be despised by people. And he's going to be rejected by by. Well, by but people, you keep right? saying he is going to be, but there is nothing in here that is future tense. It's all past all right, tense. Let's leave the tense out of it, okay? All right, so, so it doesn't. Going. Verse, it looks more to me like it's a man and not a nation. But yeah, keep going. Right. So, so I understand that perspective because it is personifying the nation of Israel, and it's speaking about the nation as if he is a person. But, but it does that all in the previous chapters leading up to it. Also, it personifies the nation of Israel as his singular servant, my servant Jacob. And Jacob was long dead, but Jacob is his name means Israel and Israel was the nation 
and Israel was the nation that was carried away into Babylonian captivity, that the entire context leading up to this tells you. So, verse 4, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he, uh, let's stop right there, verse 4. So, verse 4, again, still just saying he, and it's still talking past tense. He took up our pain and bore our suffering. So, if, if this is Israel, like I'm saying, then it's saying that in the past, the nation of Israel has suffered uh, and we have currently benefited from the suffering of past generation of Israel because the pre previous generation of Israel was suffering in, in Babylonian captivity and God was mad at them, but God restored his favor and brought, brought us out and now we are benefiting from their, uh, you know, when it says our, it's not talking about Gentiles, it's not talking about you or me, it's talking about Israel. The nation of Israel, the, the current nation of Israel that had come out of Babylonian captivity was looking back at the previous generation of Israel that was being punished by God. And the current nation had benefited from God punishing the previous generation of Israel. Now, of course, so uh, the alternative view, the Christian view, is that God, when he says he, when it says he took our pain and bore our suffering, Christians would say Jesus took our pain and bore our suffering, uh, and we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. So if Jesus, right, so your, actually, your, your, wait, so your contention is okay. I, I get where you're coming from. So you, they're referring to an older Israel that's still in bondage that has taken. Okay, that's what you. Uh, well, so so right. The previous okay. generation of Israel were the ones that suffered, and the current generation of Israel benefited because they're the ones that took the punishment. Uh, and now the current generation, which would be 500 BC, it's not current today. It was current to whoever was writing the book of Isaiah. Uh, this generation has benefited because God punished the previous generation. Because the Bob, the Old Testament says, the, yeah, but I, I get the soul sins, yeah. the soul no, who I sins shall die. And, and, it, and the Bible says that no one can suffer for the sins of another. The soul who sins shall die. In fact, the Old Testament says that it is an abomination to condemn the innocent and justify the guilty. So in the Old Testament, it was logical where innocent people got credit for being innocent and guilty people took accountability for being guilty. The innocent yeah. were innocent. The guilty were guilty. And it says it's an abomination or evil to make the innocent pay for the guilty. So, so if this is Jesus, this is a contradiction to the rest of the Hebrew Scriptures because it says no innocent person can pay for the sins of the guilty. But exactly. if that's the previous exactly generation... The, yeah. No, I get if, it, but that's why the Christians see Jesus as divine because he's not just a man, he's God as well. Well, okay, yeah, so, so right, right here in verse 4, it says, we considered him punished by God. It's not saying we considered him to be God. It says we considered him, and if that him is Jesus, it's saying that we considered Jesus to be punished by God. So Which God can't punish himself. The Father can punish the Son. Then you're just a polytheist. If, if, the, if Father God can punish Son God, that's two gods, that makes you a polytheist. No, if God and a, Jesus are one, there's only one God, then no, God no, can't the, punish himself. The same, the, the same way... The past, the present, and the future are all three time. Uh, but the the past, the present, and the future are never the same time. The past is already gone. The future hasn't got here, and the present is now. Yeah, but it's the past three, it's three ways to describe the same thing. It's time, right? It's three parts of it. The part, that's the pagan. Past if you would, real. if you would study the, the origin of Trinity, the future is real. okay. But if you would study the origin of of the Trinity, you would find out that it is pagan. It is not Hebrew. The Hebrews said there's only one God. He is the only God all by himself. He created all yeah, things. There was no one with him or beside him. Or would be... yeah, obviously, it's prophesied. The Hebrews would reject the Messiah. All right? You, that's not prophesied. Verse, no, that's not prophesied. Well, you just read that they would... They would uh, you you claim that Israel is the suffering servant, right? And then you you, you just read that he was rejected. By everyone. Right, but 
But the, this chapter says nothing about a Messiah. This is not a messianic prophecy at all. That's your opinion. Then show me where the word Messiah shows up anywhere in here. Where does it talk about uh, any Messiah in Isaiah 53? We, we, you want to keep reading and see if it shows up? It, it hasn't showed up yet. It's not off, going to either. Reading. Well, keep reading, buddy. So this is about the suffering of Israel in Babylonian captivity. Uh, so now, verse 5, this is a, f a famous Christian verse. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. So okay. here again. Explain to me, no, explain to me how you're healed by Israel's wounds. Because the previous generation, uh, no, not, wait, it's, wait first of all, Dre, it's not about me. Israel is the one being healed, right? Right. It's only, it's not about you and me. It was about wait, ancient Israel. By your, benefiting. Wait, by your logic, Israel is being, uh, the Israel's wounds are being healed by Israel. Correct. That is exactly correct. That God held the previous generation of Israel accountable for their sins because the Old Testament says the soul who sins shall die and the innocent shall not pay for the sins of the guilty. So the previous where generation was, was sinned the and they pun they were where punished was, for their sins. But now we have been, the nation of Israel has been redeemed because we are a new generation that is innocent and has not sinned. And God took out his wrath on the previous generation because they sinned. And for us, uh, we, we, God has redeemed us and brought us out because we're innocent. I get where you're coming from, but the, I totally disagree. I don't see how Israel is pierced for Israel's transgressions. It just doesn't. The previous but, generation of Israel that was guilty was punished. Yeah, like, yeah punished for their iniquities. For things. It's a deliberate word, pierced for transgression, bruised for iniquity. Right. And when they were sent away into captivity, that is a piercing and a bruising, a piercing and a crushing. They were destroyed. They were sad. They were upset. They, they wished they didn't do it because they were going through hardship as a result of their own iniquity. And, yeah. and so when it says our transgressions, it's just talking about the nation of Israel because this is Israel speaking and saying that, you know, they were just as much us as we are of them. We're still the nation of Israel, but they suffered for their sins and we have been redeemed by God. You know, all right. Keep, keep they going, took buddy. the punishment of God, but we are now free. Yeah, yeah. I get where you're coming uh, from. Let's see. Where did I get to? The crush for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace, was the punishment that brought the current nation of Israel peace was on the previous nation of Israel that suffered, and by His wounds we were healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. So the whole nation of Israel, uh. God took out his vengeance and wrath and justice on the previous nation in Babylonian captivity. So now no, we no, are no. sinless and free. It can't be a nation because it's referring to a man. All throughout, if you would study, so put this on your, take this notes, start in Isaiah chapter 40. Wait, but and my friend, wait. It, the first it starts with his appearance, right? Then it says the people yes, were rejected. Yes, the appearance of the nation right? of Israel. So, the How context can God's chosen people be lowly and um, not much to look at because they were a humble nation of people they were a bunch of ugly people with with curly sideburns and stuff you know <laughs> yeah I, I... they were a humble they were a humble people they weren't a militant group they weren't a you know they were just a humble people that wanted to have their little israel and Pretend like God loved them more than everybody else, yeah, and then everybody it's, it's keeps obvious, bothering. But, it's, but you, you claiming where it's say where it's referring to a man, you're putting your spin on it, claiming it's Israel. It's not my spin. If you would study, starting in Isaiah chapter forty, you will see that the nation of Israel is personified as a servant. It is God's servant. The nation is personified in this entire twelve chapters or thirteen chapters. Israel is personified as a man. Yeah. All right. And so um, the only thing Christians did, the no, only no, thing I, the I, Romans did, yeah. was was take this uh, where they personified Israel. And, and I can show you Hosea 11, 1 that does exactly the same thing. Let me just flip to Hosea real fast because it makes this point. No, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. No, let's finish Isaiah 53. Well, I, but this is just one verse. So I want to I just 
read one verse in Hosea 11.1, 1, which is also a, a supposed prophecy about Jesus, according to Matthew. Hosea 11.1. 1. Matthew quotes Hosea 11.1 1 and says, Out of Egypt I called my son, because he says Jesus is obviously the son. Uh, and so Matthew is the only one in the whole New Testament that says Jesus ever went to Egypt. But uh, Matthew makes up this story that Jesus went down to Egypt fleeing from Herod's infanticide deal at, after the birth, after his birth. And he quotes Hosea 11.1 1 as a prophecy. But yet if you go read Hosea 11.1, 1, it says, When Israel, Israel, you hear that? When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. You see, this is talking about the days of Moses, when the nation of Israel came out of Egypt. And, and it says the whole nation was God's son. It's personifying the nation as one person, and that one person is the Son of God. It's not Jesus. It's Israel. It expressly says Israel, and Israel was, came out of Egypt. It's talking about the days of Moses. And, and it's personifying the whole nation as the Son of God. Well, the Christians just reinterpreted it and, and created a, a demigod and said this was not Israel. Israel is done. God doesn't... like. Just listen to the Greek philosophers and the Greek yeah, theologians. Yeah. The, the one, the one major flaw in your way of thinking is, if Israel is the suffering servant, how does Israel reject Israel? How does Israel what? Reject Israel. Oh, uh, it's not saying Israel rejected Israel. It's saying that uh, that people no, rejected he would, Israel. He would so, be rejected, right? And you're so saying it's saying that people, Israel. it's saying all of our enemies reject us. Like we are the nation of Israel and everybody's our enemy. Then nobody loves us. We're just a bunch of humble, uh, you know, a bunch of humble Israelites and everybody hates us and says we're ugly and we're no good for anything. And, and then, then we go into, into captivity yeah. and everybody laughs at us and thinks, Antonio oh, you think you're special, point. but you're really not. Yeah, Antonio has a good point. Like uh, uh, Israel isn't innocent. What was that? Well, if Israel is a suffering servant and he was bruised and all of that and he was innocent, when was Israel innocent? Well, Israel considered themselves to be innocent, like no, you know, when they came out of Babylonian captivity. So whenever whenever good things happen, they say they're innocent. Whenever bad things happen, they say they're guilty. Because this was their mentality. Whenever bad things happen, God was mad at them. Okay. And whenever good so things happen, God loved okay. them. So let me just point out some flaws in your argument again one it's referring to a man right and and you made a good point where israel is referred to as, as a man right yeah so, Hosea 11 so, 1 the whole nation yeah. is called I'll, a man I'll a take son. That. all right it says that it will they will he will be rejected by israel i don't see where israel ever rejects itself and i don't see it, where but, israel but because it's that's not what it's saying it says israel was des despised and rejected by mankind it is not saying Israel was despised and rejected by Israel. You see how you you don't know what it says, or maybe you're being dishonest or or something. Verse 3 says, He was despised and rejected by mankind. That means the other people do not like us. The other people did not like Israel. Because that's why they were carried away into captivity. We were despised and rejected. We were sold as slaves. We lost our sons and daughters and mothers and fathers, we were a, 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 a miserable group of people, according yeah. to what Jeremiah says, because Jeremiah was the weeping prophet who saw the capture of Israel, yeah, or Jerusalem. But let's keep reading a little bit, because there's there's a few good yeah. verses that, that, I think we got to verse 7. All right, keep going, yeah. Uh, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to stop, the slaughter. Stop, and stop, stop. When Israel was <laughs> if, so if Israel, Israel, Israel so was when, oppressed and afflicted when the Babylonians took him away into captivity, and there's nothing they could say about it. They 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 went away, uh, uh, and they were like sheep being led to the slaughter when Israel well, was carried away into Babylonian wait, captivity. Well, stop! I'll stop you again. Didn't the Lord hear the, their cries? So if they were silent, how how did the Lord hear their cries? How did He hear Israel's cries out of Egypt? If they were silent. Uh, well, God didn't Israel hear their cries because they were carried away into captivity. Oh, God man. didn't answer okay. their prayers. 
God didn't hear them at all because they were carried away into captivity. So when the Babylonians took Israel, there's nothing they could have said or done to stop it. They, they, they may have been, some of them may have been praying, but God didn't answer their prayers, so they were led away like sheep to a slaughter. You know, so, and that's also hyperbole too. So it's like, you know, when, you, when you're running sheep through uh, the, the shoots and stuff to lead them to slaughter, they're all buying and neighing and stuff like that too. But you can say, well, hey, the sheep don't even know that they're being led to their death. Uh, yeah, so you, you say the they're happy up until the last moment. They do make sound. All right, keep going. Yeah. All right, so let's see. As sheep before the shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of this who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. So Israel was cut off from the land of the living and had to be carried away into slavery. So this is what it's about. But the reason that it lines up so no, closely with the Jesus narrative. Not being, wait, going into slavery is not being cut off from the land of the living. Cut yeah, it is. The land Most, of the living, there were a lot of people that were, head. there were a lot of people that were, uh, they would they considered the land of live, the living Israel, the land that was flowing with milk and honey, their homeland. Whenever you get taken out of your homeland, you don't even have to die. You would still say that we were cut off from the land of the living because the only place to live is in Israel. So, but many of them were unalived and they did end their life. But many of them were carried away into captivity. But for both of those groups of people, you could still say that they were cut off from the land of the living because they thought the land of the living was only the nation of Israel. Okay, keep going. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. For the transgression of Israel, the previous generation of Israel was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked so okay, did, wait, wait, was stop. jesus well okay. yes he was assigned a grave with the wicked but there was nobody the end, in the grave no that was a rich man's tomb there was no exactly. other people in there Yeah, he was assigned but right at the end the rich guy came and he said whoa 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 give him my grave okay uh, read it. he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death though he had Stop, done stop no right violence. There. Stop right there. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, but the rich in death. That's another Jesus prophecy. How does that refer to Israel? Where was Israel? Just explain that to me. That where's Israel's grave with with the wicked, and where's where's the um, at the death the rich man's tomb? Like explain that to me. So Babylon was the land of the dead according to the Israel's perspective, and they were wealthy, but they were also considered dead. Babylon was the enemy. They were rich and powerful, but they were they had no connection to God according to the Israel perspective. So, so this is saying when Israel was carried away into Babylon, they were taken out of the land of the living, and uh, their grave, which was Babylon, most of, well, all of, you say all of them died in Babylon. Those people that, that, that didn't die in Jerusalem in the war, they they went to Babylon and died there. So their grave was made with the wicked in Babylon because they were the enemy. Uh, and even though they were rich and powerful, Babylon was, they ruled the world. Uh, yeah, but like in death with the rich. So the Israel Yeah, they died. died. Those people died in the land of the people that ruled, ruled the world and rich and powerful. All right. And, and so, going. listen, so, so really you've got two options. You can either believe that, that this is some miraculous prediction of the future, or you can say that the Greeks who wrote the New Testament read this and they created the narrative to fit this story. Because this is not a messianic prophecy at all. There's nothing about a Messiah who's going to come and die. This was about the suffering of Israel, but, but, the, but the enemies of the Jews, who were the Romans in the first century, they read this and said, wow, I got a great idea. Let's say that this sorrow and, and shame that fell on Israel is about their Messiah because they were revolting against Rome because they expected a Messiah to bring them victory. And this is what motivated their revolt. But the Romans destroyed the Jews and then they redefined the Messiah and said, no, your Messiah is the dead guy. You remember all that scripture that you, that you wrote about the suffering of Israel and Babylonian captivity? 
that was really secretly about your Messiah. It's like, no, it's not our Messiah. That was Israel suffering in Babylonian captivity and God redeemed us. And he's like, sorry, yeah, dudes, yeah, you lost your, the war. That's your opinion, but, that, but that's, well, so, that's his so, opinion. Right. But it's so not, listen, that's, that's it's what a, I'm telling you. It's a you. very disputed opinion. Okay, but keep well, going. So, so I, what I'm telling you is you have two options. You either say that God was miraculously predicting a dead Messiah that nobody even understood originally, or you say that the enemies of the Jews who wrote the New Testament were mocking the Jews by taking all the scriptures that talk about suffering Israel and said, that's your Messiah. So the, and that's far more likely. It doesn't require any miracles. It just requires an or, enemy of the Jews to, or, to interpret or, the scriptures in a different way. Or I, can take, or I can take the text as what it is, and it talks about a man would be rejected, a man that would be bruised. No, 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 stop. Would... No, 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 stop. It does not talk about a man that would be rejected. It talks about a man that was rejected. So that's, okay. you keep yeah. you oh. keep projecting it as a future prophecy, and it's not. There All is right. nothing right. in Let's here the about it. predicting it the future. A man. It talks about a man. It talks a man about that appearance. was. So if you want to take it for what it says, quit trying to change it and make it predicting the future when it actually says it's somebody that already suffered. All right, so, keep going. All right, so let's see. Where did I get to? Nine? Past, no, ten, I think. Just past the grave of the rich. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think verse 10. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. So, did Jesus have any offspring? Christianity, Christians, that's the offspring. No, Jesus himself in John chapter 20 or 21, he said, go and tell my brothers, uh, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And the, the New Testament says that Jesus was the firstborn among many brothers, not children. Christianity is not the children of Jesus. We are the brothers of Jesus. So right. Jesus had no offspring. Jesus was not the father. So this, but Israel did have children. Jesus, or Israel did have offspring and Israel's days were prolonged, but Jesus's days were not prolonged. Jesus's days were cut short and he went to heaven. Jesus, okay. Jesus claimed his kingdom will last forever. So yeah, it's, keep going. All right. So Jesus didn't have offspring and his days weren't prolonged, but Israel's, did have offspring, and Israel's days were prolonged. Uh, verse 11, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. So after he has suffered, he will see life and be satisfied. So I guess you would say this is when he went to heaven, uh, but there's no concept of heaven in the Old Testament anywhere. So what any Israelite reading this would have to think is that you're going to live longer on the earth and you're going to have children and see your offspring. But from the Greek perspective, they say, oh, no, we can just put that in heaven. So that's that's the difference there. So by his knowledge, my righteous servant, there's the word servant. So that's the first time the word servant comes up. And many times before Isaiah 53, uh, it says Israel is my servant. So here in verse 11, it brings up the word servant and, and the context has expressly and explicitly identified Israel as the servant. So Christians yeah. just want to change the servant and say, oh, no, this is about Jesus. Yeah, but it's just strange to me how you think that Israel is the servant, but Israel also rejects the servants, or Israel's rejecting themselves, which is kind of like... Listen, Dre, you keep being dishonest. Verse 3 says, he was despised and rejected by mankind, not by Israel. It does not say Israel rejected Israel or he rejected himself. It doesn't say that. I'm not saying that. So why are you pretending like I said it? It says, he, whoever the servant is, was rejected by mankind. That means just other people. It does not say, and I'm not saying, that Israel rejected itself. Well, it perfectly fits with, um, with Jesus because Israel did reject the Messiah. They did reject Jesus. 
The reason it perfectly fits Jesus, is because the, Jesus, the Greeks the, took yeah, this yeah. narrative. This is where they this is how they created the Jesus narrative. They they found Isaiah 53 and said, wow, let's just write a story where the, the Messiah dies, like Isaiah 53 says, and we'll we'll that take is, it that's your, we'll take it yeah, verse that, by that, verse and we'll tell opinion. a story about it. That's just your opinion. There's no proof of what you're saying. There's some, there's uh circumstantial proof and opinions, but it's not really Right. There's far more evidence to support my side than your side, though. It's far more likely that I'm correct than than you and all other Christians are, because uh, Jesus didn't have offspring. Jesus's days were not prolonged. Uh, and all this stuff fits with with is with Israel being the servant and Israel suffering uh, and then coming out of Babylonian captivity because it fits the context. It fits the the timing and the the. Uh, the tense of the verbs, you have to change the tense of the verbs and pretend like it's future when it's actually speaking about the past. It's not, there is nothing in here saying, I am predicting the future. There's nothing in here about a Messiah. It's about a suffering servant, and the servant is expressly called Israel. Many, many but times in the chapters it leading it up to this. That the servant will die. It also says, so. And and, Israel, and the servant did die when they when Israel was carried into Babylonian Israel, captivity. If Israel died, you can't say when when it says Israel died that means some Israelites died. It says Israel. It says the suffering servant will die. It says the suffering servant will be prescribed a grave. Right, well, amongst... listen, we've only got one more verse in Isaiah fifty three. So yeah. let's get through it. Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, verse twelve, last verse. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great. And he will divide the spoils with the strong, uh, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Mm. Was Jesus yes. numbered with the transgressors? Yes. Oh yeah. So Jesus was a sinner. No, but he was numbered with them. Oh, what does that mean? It means he took all the sins of the world upon himself. It means so, the so father. He was so he was, no, he was numbered uh, so he was when you're counting up all the sinners you gotta you gotta count jesus among the sinners well he was it's not saying that he is them. so if the he was counted the son, the with the transgressors the that means he is a transgressor no if you're counted if you're counted with the criminals it doesn't necessarily mean you're a criminal <laughs> okay uh maybe maybe that makes sense for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So, all right. But yet, when did, when did, when did Israel bore the sins of many? So Israel, when they are, when the previous generation of Israel went into captivity, they satisfied the wrath of God and the justice of God. And then the, when those generation of people died, when they were numbered, when, when they were uh, taken out of the land of the living and they died in captivity, the next generation God pulled out of captivity and they were redeemed. And the previous generation suffered for their sins, but the new generation benefited from the previous generation uh, being punished by God. And so yeah. the previous Israel, the servant of Israel, uh, the servant of God, which was expressly and explicitly called Israel, they suffered in Babylonian captivity. And then the, the generation that came out said, oh, I thank God and I thank the previous uh, servant who suffered. You know, So what they're doing is they're glorifying their deceased ancestors. Yeah. My grandpa died in captivity and I want to glorify my grandpa who died in captivity. Yeah, That's what it is. Um, okay, cool. Um, yeah, dude, it's like almost one in the morning. So I think I'm going to drop off and let someone else on. But All right, Jeff, well, I, I, it was a good, was it was a good like, chat, really though. Enjoyed it really was a good chat, and I have a lot of notes that I'm going to go study afterwards. You've been a good guest this entire time. We've been talking about valuable things this entire time, and so I think it was really good. I appreciate you being here. All right, my friend. Check you again, man. See you later. Cheers.